Well, look, when I'm negotiating with someone for a business deal, let's say, or you know, uh, when I'm trying to formulate a strategy that enables me to work happily together with someone over the long run, I'm hoping that they'll be thrilled with the deal. Like, sure. I'm not trying to win. Of course. I think, well, I would like to set you up in a situation so that you could pursue our mutual goals completely of your own accord. And then I don't even have to watch you, right? Because you're doing things for whatever reasons you have. But this this is the thing. This is, this is what I don't quite understand, is that that self-interest, okay, so it seems to me that for that self-interest to work, then it has to be a self-interest that's commensurate with the structure that would emerge if everyone was pursuing their self-interest simultaneously. You, you see what I mean? It's Not because, everyone. Well, okay, okay, okay. So, so let's say you and I make an arrangement, and it's a long-term arrangement, and at one point you decide that it's in your self-interest to violate that agreement because you can garner an intense short-term gain as a consequence. But there's a long-term cost. Okay, that's fine. Okay, so because so, I ruin this relationship, and also there's a long-term cost in terms of myself. You okay, know, right? what's the cost? The cost is I'm no longer a person of integrity. I'm not a man of my word. So Rand says there's two Rand quotes. We should go first. Quote, she says that man is a being of self-made soul, and she also says in the Fountainhead, which is about Howard Work, the architect, mm -hmm. that a building has integrity just like a man and just as seldom. Uh, right. So you're seeing her self-interest as something that's nested inside a larger scale conceptualization of integrity. Yes. And and then okay. And so and, in fact, the whole point of the Fountainhead is she's contrasting these two types of selfishness. The first is Peter Keating, who's this basic striver, social climber, who has no internal self at all, no values other than what he sees around him. In, in fact, the working title of The Fountainhead was Secondhand Lives. Yeah, Because right. Rand was working in Hollywood, and she asked the woman who she was working with, and there's just kind of this like pin drop moment where she's like, I'm looking in the face of the devil, where the woman goes, I'll tell you what I want. If someone has a, a, a cloth coat, I want a fur coat. If you have one car, I want two. If your house is 500 square feet, I want a thousand square right. foot house. And Rand is like, oh my, I've, she's like, this is evil. Someone right. who has no self and whose values are a strictly a function of, of comparison. the values of those around her. Right, but okay, as but opposed, why hold on, is, hold on, yeah. as opposed to Howard Rourke, who is selfish in the sense that he pursues his own goals and values in accordance with his moral code. And, and I think... Those are the two definitions of selfish. I know oh, Okay, okay. so let's still, place with fine, them. fine. So let's still, cer certainly Keating is portrayed in Rand as nothing but a, but he's the kind of social climber who will do anything to gain comparative status yes. in his profession. But he will right? never be able to tell you why he wants the status. What is he going to do with it? It's it's kind of just in and of itself good, but he does, right. has no value. Well, okay, so that's that's the thing that's 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 interesting to me because... I don't think I don't think that it's appropriate to presume that the mere search for social status is not self-interest. Now, I'm not I know you're making a more sophisticated argument than that, but I want to elaborate it completely. So I can say, I'm gonna play devil's advocate against Rand and, and for now we can okay. do that. Okay, so I would say, well, on what grounds are you criticizing Peter Keating's decision, self-interested decision, to prioritize status above all else? I mean, that's what he thinks is appropriate, apparently. And so on what grounds is that an inappropriate conclusion? Well, I wouldn't even say that he thinks it. I think it's more that he's kind of taken this uh, subconscious, subconsciously from the ethos. He does not someone who thinks these things through. He just goes with what everyone else tells him. Fine. I got you. I've got no objections to that. Yeah. I think that's how he's portrayed. But what on what grounds do you believe that that's inappropriate? Because just because his self-interest doesn't match that of and you know Peter Keating is an archetypal character in the Rand sure, universe, yes. right? I mean, he's duplicated in many other characters like Ellsworth Toohey, for example, is like a meta Keating, essentially, right. although he's the spider behind the scenes who's orchestrating yes. everything, but he claims to be selfless, but he's certainly pursuing comparative status like Keating is. But 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 and there's a very powerful overt and covert implication in Ram that the path that Keating and Tui takes is inappropriate, and the path that Rourke takes, or Francisco de Coney, and I'm probably mixing up the characters in the book at the moment, is the path of like true individual heroism. Yes. That's the romantic adventure part. But the exactly the reason they're they're both self-interested. 
They're not self-interested okay. because Peter Keating doesn't have a self. There's okay. no one there. That's okay. That, fine. And, and that I, was my I, mystery. I, I, so, it, so what does it mean for there to be something there? I'll, right? Because I'll, so he's reduced, I'll he's reduced you. himself to one dimension, which is social comparison. But that's not nothing. That's one dimension. But it's it's nothing to him. It doesn't matter to him. It only matters to other people. So therefore, it matters to him. This is not coming from the call. Is not coming from inside the house. And this is where I would bring in Albert Camus, because I give, I sometimes I've been talks about networking. And one of the advice I give people, I say, if you know someone's in town for their birthday, right? I go, I always take out that person for their birthday, and I do it for selfish reasons, right? And everyone laughs. And I go, the reason I do it is because don't you want to be the guy? who takes people out for their birthday, right, he's awesome. Right, right. You can, it, what's it going to cost you? 25 bucks in an right, hour? Right. So the whole point of the Camus kind of absurdism is that life is inherently meaningless, but this is a wonderful opportunity because you can be the kind of person that you want. And it's not necessarily that hard. It's just being consistent. So if you want to be someone who's high status, who no one genuinely, who, no one who genuinely knows you likes or admires, Knock yourself out. Yeah. At a certain point, the brain can only dilute right. itself. It's counterproductive. It's counter. Yeah. Or do you want to be the kind of person who, when faced with tough decisions, as I have in my life and as you have in your life, we're like, you know what? 20 years from now, I'm going to look back at this fork in the road and I'm going to chastise myself if I buckle and do the weak thing, even though it's going to cost me something in the medium term. These are two different paths yeah. that Rand portrays. Oh, okay, okay. So, and I so, think that's a very a, a good moral code to live by. Okay, so let me extract out some principles from that. And you tell me what you think. So one of the things that I proposed was that, you know, a very young person, two years old, is still a relatively unintegrated yes conflict of internal dimensions, motivational dimensions. That's sure, a good way of thinking sure. about it. Okay, now, we also hypothesize that the problem with Keating and Tui, for example, is that they sacrifice to social status, so they become one-dimensional, and you portrayed it as a false dimension, and you said there's no self there. Okay, so here's a hypothesis about why it's a false, why it's false, okay? And you tell me what you think about this. Okay, sure. so imagine that there that there's a set of constraints that are implicit in the natural and the social world, such that if all these underlying motivational systems want to optimize their interrelationships, and they want to optimize their interrelationships in a social world, and they want to optimize their interrelationships across time, so it iterates that a pattern will that a necessary pattern will emerge. Now, I think that's the pattern that your conscience calls you on when you deviate from, by the way. And I also think it's the pattern that makes things interesting to you in the world. So imagine that out of this internal conflict of spirits, that's a good way of thinking about it, there's a way of, a mode of integration, and that's that will satisfy all these internal systems in the optimal possible manner, and then there's an instinct that feeds that development, that calls to you by making things interesting to you that would force you to develop in an integrated direction or that emerges as conscience if you fail to do it. And that that's not a unidimensional system of value. It's a multidimensional system of value and it's a multidimensional iterable system of value that also works so that if you play that game and I play that game and we occupy the same territory, both of our games will improve, right? So it's not a zero sum. It's not a zero sum optimization. Okay, so then this is where I have part, maybe problems with the concept of anarchy per se. So let me tell you why. So does any of that seem inappropriate no, to you? No, that seems fine. Okay, that's of course. That, that seems fine. Okay, okay. so, okay, so 